for Reimagine 2020. I'm Yona Hockhauser. Today, I am glad to be joined by Morgan Politon, principal at Comcox Ventures. Morgan, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Yona. Excited to be here. All right. Well, first, you want to give our audience a little background about yourself and, and kind of how you got in or find yourself in the blockchain world? Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> I'll take it back to 2013 uh, when I first read the Bitcoin white paper. Um, at the time, I was working in the nonprofit space down in D.C., and I happened to be surrounded by a lot of economists and, uh, <clears throat> and, and was also had a you know, background from college. I went to Northeastern University in business and, and, and startups and technology. And so when I read the white paper, I got, I got very interested. Um, and, you know, I found it because some of my economist friends showed it to me. Uh, I wasn't smart enough to, you know, put my entire life savings into Bitcoin at that point. I probably wouldn't need to work if I did. Um, frankly, I wasn't even smart enough to put $100 into Bitcoin, uh, which, which I almost certainly should have done. Um, but I got excited about the technology. Uh, I didn't really do anything much with it at that point. Um, but, you know, kind of fast forward several years uh, in my, to my first job in the, uh, in the venture capital space, um, which was at Bloomberg Beta. Uh, uh, it was the, you know, Bloomberg's venture fund. Um, and that was 2015. So it was a couple years later, crypto was, um, you know, even more prominent. Uh, still mainly about Bitcoin. And I got to the funds, you know, I was brand new and I said, Hey, I think we should think about investing in crypto. And, uh, you know, folks were skeptical to say the least, um, skeptical, but interested, but it ended up being that because in 2015 crypto was all about Bitcoin, it was all about money. It was all about disrupting wall street and, you know, all the biggest wall street banks were customers of Bloomberg's. Um, you know, that we, we, we basically decided to uh, put guardrails around crypto and not invest in the space. So it wasn't until two years later when I moved to Comcast Ventures, which is the current fund I'm at. Um, and this was 2017, late 2017, that the timing was right. So the, this was in the midst of the crypto bubble um, when Bitcoin reached 20,000 and every VC fund felt like they had to have an opinion or perspective on, on crypto and make a couple investments. And uh, typically what, what happened is they would, they would pull the younger crowd in the VC fund and say, who's excited about crypto? And you know, at least one person would usually raise their hand, like, okay, go figure it out. Let's see what we should do. Um, and that ended up being me. Um, and uh, so you know, along with a couple other colleagues, I explored the space, met with a lot of folks. We made you know, a handful of investments um, and I've been tracking you know, crypto ever since. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned that now you're at Comcast Ventures. Is Comcast Ventures a strictly crypto-focused fund, or, or, and, and is it connected with Comcast, the media company? Yeah, great question. So we are not a crypto-focused fund, and um, we are not a, a fund that invests only on, you know, in, in the areas that Comcast is interested in. Um, the, way, the right way to think about us is, you know, we are a traditional venture fund, um, just like any you might, you know, hear in the news except that we only have one investor who gives us capital to invest, which is Comcast, NBC Universal. Um, so we've been around for 20 years. We're actually a very generalist fund. We invest in both, you know, everything from, um, you know, away luggage to quantum computing. It's uh, quite a wide range. Um, and we invest very early and also, you know, quite late. Um, so, you know, our check size is very, and we try to just stay on top of anything that's interesting um, and, and invest where we think the you know, best returns will be. Um, so, you know, crypto and blockchain is a part of that, uh, but it's not the entire focus. And would you say in the fund that, you know, blockchain is viewed more as the riskier end of the fund or, or more of the, you know, I don't know, out there end of the fund? How, how is blockchain viewed? Not, not in your eyes, because, you know, you're more familiar with crypto blockchain, but but in the more traditional people working in the fund, how, how, do they view it as something silly or something legit? <laughs> Good question. Um, it's definitely uh, a, a bit on the edge. So we, we, we have kind of six broad categories that we think about when it comes to investing. Um, first is consumer. Second is enterprise. Third is fintech. 
Fourth is cybersecurity. Fifth is digital health. And then the sixth bucket is this somewhat catch-all bucket called frontier technology. And in from that frontier technology bucket are a whole bunch of technologies that are all emerging. They're relatively early. They show great promise, but um, they're not as mature as some of the other buckets. Um, and so, you know, it, it's technologies like artificial intelligence and cryptocurrency and blockchain fall into that category as well. Um, and so, you know, I think people in, in, in my fund are, are familiar with the promise of the technology. I mean, that's one of the things that um, when we started to invest in this space, we, we kind of made sure we uh, educated folks on the space broadly, not just the specific investments. Um, and some of my colleagues also in, invested in companies themselves, you know, in the crypto space. It wasn't just, uh, it wasn't just myself. Um, so I'd say, I'd say we're pretty, you know, knowledgeable about it. Um, but, you know, I think the perspective, and maybe we can dive into this in future questions, is that there, there's still a lot of risk involved, um, you know, relative to other spaces that we could invest in. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're not yet kind of pushing all our cards, all our chips into the table, um, but we're watching closely. We're making kind of selected investments. Um, and my bet is that in the near future, um, it will become, you know, a, a growing proportion of our portfolio. And, and what was that kind of, uh, you know, spark that, that, that made, that, that, that made Comcast Ventures open up their eyes uh, to blockchain and also, and also other VC funds in general? Was it kind of the ICO boom and they're saying, whoa, there's a lot of money to be, a lot of money and in, 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 in capital going into this? Or, or was it more they saw projects and like, wow, these are really interesting projects. These might be something to invest in uh, and, and, and thought that, hey, the money's not there yet, but the money will come. It's a combination of factors. So <clears throat> I think for sure the hook was the prices. I mean, I think that's what grabs everyone's attention, whether you're an investor um, from the traditional uh, world or a crypto investor or an engineer or, you know, just the, the prices dominate the headlines. You can't get away from that. So in 2017, when the prices were rising very quickly, um, I think that for sure was the hook. There's like, what is going on here? There's, you know, there's an emerging technology, prices are rising um, and people are making money. Well, we're investors in emerging technology, so we should probably pay attention to this, right? So that was the first thing. The second thing is that we started to see an influx of founders who were starting projects, uh, projects and companies, right? So like token projects and, and traditional startups in the space. And so, you know, to, to be able to converse intelligently and, and analyze, you know, with the founders and analyze these opportunities, we had to, we had to ramp up our knowledge just to deal with that inbound deal flow. So that was the second thing. Um, I think the third thing is that there was, you know, I don't think anyone would um, be smirched me for saying this, but there was a little bit of a, a slight fear or worry, especially with initial coin offerings where, you know, technical teams who wanted to start something who previously would go only to the venture capital sector for capital, we're now raising, uh, you know, raising money from a global audience um, without going through, you know, our industry as a gatekeeper. Um, and, you know, we, I think a lot of VCs have seen disruptive innovation from uh, a different perspective, right? From the sense of like, we are funding disruptive innovation in a different industry. <laughs> Um, and, and I think this was the first time where there was a legit um, and credible chance that like some of what we do w um, would be disrupted and we have new forms of competition and there'll be alternatives to, to entrepreneurs. Um, and so I think that was the third kind of thing that, um, that led a lot of VCs to, to, to dive into the space. Um, and you know, we, all, we all dove in with varying levels of intensity um, but I think, I, I think everyone was paying attention. By that. I mean, and I, I think you raised an important point there. I mean, it, it, I think it's super interesting and that's why I was very excited to speak to you to get your point of view and the kind of the VC point of view about ICOs because ICOs are, are very different, um, uh, animal from VCs. And I think that one of the biggest differences there is equity, uh, with the ICOs, you weren't buying equity. You were kind of hoping that the, it, it, mostly in speculation that the price of this token 
that might have utility, might not, would raise and you could sell it and make money. Um, so I, I want to hear your, your point of view from both sides. One, from the size of the VCs who wanted to invest in ICOs, were, were they kind of put off by the idea or, 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 or kind of not willing because they said, wait a second, when we invest in projects, we get equity. Here, I'm investing in the ICO, I'm not getting equity. What's, what's the promise here? So one, was that a big factor for why VCs were scared to go into ICOs? Because I mean, listen, VCs aren't necessarily scared of new technologies. This is what they do. They invest in new technologies, but, but here the difference being the equity. So one, my question is, was the lack of equity a big uh, uh, you know, barrier of entry or, 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 or turnoff for VCs going in? Um, and then also on the other end, um, you know, for VCs, you, you know, first answer that question, because because I think there's enough there that and they don't want to get to what you mentioned about VCs being scared of ICOs taking away uh, a piece of their pie. But, but first, my question about yeah. VCs going into ICOs. Yeah, it, it's a very good question. And um, yes, is the short answer <laughs> that, that there that created a lot of friction. Right. So, you know, the, the way VC works is, you know, obviously we are buying equity in a company, um, you know, not only are we buying equity, we're, we're buying a specific type of equity, uh, which is preferred equity, uh, not, not the common equity that, you know, founders and employees have. And that preferred equity comes with a lot of rights and preferences uh, that we are used to having as an industry. Um, you know, I won't go into the details, but, you know, you get a lot of protections um, as an investor holding preferred equity relative to common. Um, and, you know, most VCs, it would be a deal breaker to buy common equity because of the lack of protections, right? So that, that's the kind of paradigm um, under which we operate, you know, the VC industry operates currently. And then you had these projects, as you mentioned, that did not have, um, you know, we're not selling equity, but we're selling tokens. And tokens have even less protection than even common equity. <laughs> You know, common equity shareholders under Delaware law still have rights um, and still have, uh, you know, some protections, but, um, but tokens had none of that. And so there was definitely a um, control and protection and, and risk tolerance that, uh, or risk level in buying tokens that I think were hard for a lot of VCs to get past. Um, in addition, there were uh, regulatory concerns that um, I think are still present for a lot of folks. Um, and that is the, you know, what is the securities classification of these tokens, you know, um, by the SEC? You know, a lot of the early ICOs, you know, did obviously not register their token offerings with the SEC. Uh, it, was, it was kind of a gray area. Um, but when you, you know, when, when you sniff under the hood, in many cases, the tokens look like securities uh, if you apply something called the Howey test to them. And so um, it was very, it was unclear whether um, ICOs were breaking the law, operating in a gray area, or were legal. Um, it was unknown. And we've, we've gotten some more clarity on that, you know, over time. Um, but that was also a big hurdle. Uh, spent you know a lot of time with our our counsel and external law firms trying to understand the risk level there, um, and then you know the the third thing is okay these tokens you know they don't have a lot of protection um, there's regulatory uncertainty as to their status um, and you know how do you value them right like you know in traditional finance you have various valuation metrics that you can use, right? You can value a company based on their cash flows. You can compare it to similar companies in the public markets or, you know, acquisitions that were made in the private markets. And you can get a like rough sense of what the fair valuation um, is for a startup. Like this had none of that, right? There was no formal way to value these tokens. There were no co uh, comparables because they were pretty much brand new. So, so valuation like, is this a fair price or is this overpriced or is this underpriced? I mean, we, you know, really had no idea. That's a third level of friction. And the fourth level of friction um, is that, okay, how do we actually custody these tokens if we decide to buy them? Um, you know, again, in the traditional uh, VC sector, you 
receive, um, you can think of it as a paper stock certificate, even though it's all digital these days, but you get a stock certificate representing your ownership and that provides you a legal claim um, on, on your equity. And you, you know, typically store that with a custodian, you know, a bank who does this for a living and, you know, it's pretty cheap, it's pretty easy, and there's not much um, risk there. It's not something we worry about. But with these tokens, it was completely different. There was no third party company, um, established company that we, you know, were able to trust to custody these tokens for us. So, you know, we were basically um, accepting the fact that we would have to self custody. And, you know, we were, we, we ended up trying to become security experts overnight, right? Like, okay, how, we should get hardware wallets, we should get, you know, safety deposit boxes and geographically distributed banks. We need, you know, multi-sig, who are they going to be this? I mean, it was like this whole thing. This is, you know, so I, I, there's probably a bunch of other risk areas that I have I've even declined to uh, include here, but th there was a lot. Um, and, you know, as a result, I think you, well, we'll get into what VCs as a group actually did. Um, you know, cause, cause I think, you know, all of the things that I just mentioned led to, you know, a few different types of actions that VCs did in the crypto space. Well, that, that was right then. So let's bring it a little more current, a little more present. You mentioned those four friction points. Well, let's break down and down now if they still exist. Let's, let's start off with regulation. Is the regulation there and clear enough uh, that VC funds are actually now willing to take a serious look um, at, at crypto and at blockchain companies? Yes and no. Um, <clears throat> so since, since that time that I was talking about, right, early, you know, mid-2017, um, you had, you know, you had the SEC basically say Bitcoin has a, you know, is, is clear, right? It's not, it's not a security. There was no sale to begin with. So, you know, we're giving it the regulatory green light. Um, you had them, you know, the SEC say Ethereum, while probably an illegal sale of securities in the beginning is now so decentralized and there's no party, there's no central party to go after that we're kind of, you know, we're looking the other way there and, and you're in the clear. Um, so, so that was, that happened after this kind of initial wave of, um, you know, VCs trying to figure out what to do in the space. So that gave some clarity, but, you know, VCs weren't really in, considering investing in Bitcoin and Ether for the most part, they were looking at these brand new projects. So it still didn't provide a lot of clarity um, on those projects. Um, and then you had, uh, you know, you had the SEC go after some projects. And at first it was kind of clearly fraudulent projects where, you know, the teams just disappeared with the money. So I was like, okay, we're, we're not investing in those anyways. Um, but then they went after, you know, kick. Um, and that, I think that confirmed a lot of the worries of VCs, right? It's like, oh, this is like, you know, a good team, an established project um, with good intentions. It's just that they may have overstepped and we don't, you know, we don't want to have invested in a project that gets um, subpoenaed by the SEC and investigated for, for securities fraud. So I, I think that that puts some, through some cold water on the space for, for a lot of VCs. At the same time, you had a, a project like Blockstack um, which, you know, did a, <clears throat> a, an IPO of sorts, a mini IPO, right? A regulation, a plus offering, I believe is what they did. Um, you know, and where it, it showed, I think that was an important milestone for, for VCs because I mean, one, they're a VC backed company, right? So union square and other VCs invested in them. Um, and it showed that there was a legit liquidity path for token projects and, you know, like, props to the block stack team because I think they, you know, they were the guinea pig and they did a lot of upfront work to try to figure out like what that path is. And now it's easier for other companies to follow in their footsteps. Um, so I think that did provide a little more certainty. Um, but I, I wouldn't say like, I think what would really unlock, um, you know, traditional venture capital from a regulatory risk perspective is some kind of safe Harbor, right. That says, you know, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not gonna be able to craft the right policy, but, you know, we had a safe harbor of sorts um, for internet startups, right? There was also a lot of regulatory uncertainty uh, at the time, you know, with content, copyright, all these things. Um, but the SEC kind of carved out the space and said, okay, you know, you have a safe harbor um, and here's, here's the criteria you need to meet to hit the safe harbor. 
And we're just gonna, you know, we're gonna put this in place so as not to squelch innovation in the U.S. Um, uh, and and we're not gonna apply like the same, you know, regulation regulatory framework that we've applied for older industries here until we come to understand better what this space is all about. I think that's what that's what crypto needs from a you know to get traditional VC capital um, to invest more actively from a regulatory perspective because. Without that, it's very much still a case by case analysis. You know, like we're still like consulting counsel to apply the Howey test on uh, on a per project basis, and it's just not it's not a scalable way to invest. And, and is there a big push actively, a big push to, to try to get that safe harbor built? And and have you heard anything you know uh, from regulators that that they are working on a safe harbor like that? I, I don't know if they're working on a safe harbor specifically, but regulators are certainly paying attention. Um, and you know um, they're they're making progress. You know the the recent OCC ruling that that allowed you know every traditional bank to custody crypto was a big milestone, um, which is both regulatory and you know hits on the custody friction that we talked about earlier. Um, and you know there are uh, you know really good lobbying groups now that represent the crypto industry that you know go to DC and go to the Hill and explain how everything works and suggest policy. So that's a very good development. Um, and, and some VC firms have been involved in some of those efforts. I think Andres and USV, um, you know, have, have, have made that visit. And so, you know, I think things are happening. I don't, I can't comment on specifically what's happening now or regards to the safe Harbor, but um, I'm hopeful that something like that will be coming in the next few years. And, and one of those other frictions you mentioned was this custody. Um, you know, there, there are a lot more custody solutions here. Um, and is, is that what VC, it, one, is the custody solutions good enough for VCs and, and big institutions uh, to feel secure? And two, what kind of solution would they be going for? Would, would, they, would they want to then hold their own uh, coins on a hardware wallet? Would they go to a third party? Would they go to an exchange um, or, uh, or a company that specifically tailors to VC um, and big institutions, uh, custody services like that. I don't. I don't think most VCs would want to self custody. Um, it's it. You know, it's too much risk, uh, and you know we don't have internal security expertise, and we don't really want to build that. Um, so I think it's going to be third party. Um, I don't think you need to have a firm that specifically only serves VC. I mean our. Um, I think most of what we would look for would be similar to other investors, whether they're crypto funds who are choosing to outsource their custody, traditional, you know, Wall Street, um, or, or, or other, you know, high net worths, et cetera. Um, so, so I think, you know, you, there are some solutions now that are out there that um, are, are more mature and have evolved their product. I think the one, the one thing that VC, the one unique need that VC has from a customer perspective that I think a lot of other institutional investors do not is um, support for extremely early long tail crypto projects. So, you know, this, so last I met, so I met with like all the custody providers, you know, when we were trying to figure this out, um, I haven't met with them recently, so I, I may not have the most up to date information. But at the time, um, most of the custodians were serving or were, were supporting you know, the, the most liquid projects, understandably, because they tended to have the most customer demand. Then it makes sense for them to, to you know, do all the, um, you know, the technical integration work to support like a brand new token that won't launch for two years that five people want to custody. Um, it made more sense to support you know, Bitcoin, ETH, Ripple, et cetera. Um, and so that, that was a big hurdle. Right, all the projects that we actually want to custody as early stage VCs um, were not supported, um, and, uh, and and so you know it, it's possible that um, you know you could build infrastructure to easily add tokens, um, but it just wasn't there at the time. So so that that's unique to VC, but I think that's really that's really the only thing. Um, and who knows, I'm excited to see what comes out of the OCC ruling, like what, you know, there, there were a bunch of rumors back in 2017 about all these banks working on custody solutions. Um, and, 
you know, it, it largely hasn't materialized after, you know, after the price dropped. Um, but, but I think that, that may be changing. And, you know, one of those other friction points you mentioned was the inability to properly evaluate, uh, you know, the, the value of a token or a project because there just was nothing traditionally to compare it to. Um, is that still the same situation today? I mean, I know that it's still a tremendously young, young technology, but it still is another two years, another three years. Uh, and on top of that, there, there are a lot of unique data points that are more, more relevant um, in blockchain and in cryptocurrencies than in traditional finance. I know for one being a sentiment analysis, like, well, like the tie does, where, um, that, where because these projects are way more heavily uh, um, reliant on communities, more so than traditional technology, um, so the sentiment data is a little more relevant, as well as just, you know, we have seen projects around right now to compare them to. Is there still that same trouble of proper valuation for VCs in blockchain? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It's the problem still there. Um, <clears throat> so just, just to give like, you know, the audience a, a comparison, um, uh, kind of even stepping outside of VC, just traditional finance versus like crypto finance or crypto economics is, is you know, you might say. Um, so in traditional finance, like, you, you know, there are kind of well-proven theoretical models for how to value companies. You know, I mentioned cash flows, like there's something called a discounted cash flow model that like every Wall Street analyst learns in their first year. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of both like theoretical work, empirical work, um, and just industry track record with using something like that to, to value a company. Um, and there is no equivalent to that in crypto, right? Um, and so, so that that's, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is that even at a more fundamental level, um, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, convicted that every crypto project understands how they capture value in the first place, right? Like value capture mechanisms in crypto are still, I think, being experimented with and figured out, right? Um, and so if you don't have that figured out, that's, that's even a preliminary step to valuing it, right? To, in order to value a crypto, let's say someone comes up with a, a DCF for crypto. Um, well, what are you actually measuring? There's no cash flows. So you, you're, you're, which in equity is how you capture value. So in, in the crypto world, um, you have to have the, you know, the, the, the cash flow analog um, for, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna measure this value capture mechanism in crypto and then you know, compare it to you know, other projects and compare it to future um, you know, projections and, and, and figure out what, what appropriate valuation is. Um, and you know, I think there's no universal mechanism to do that across crypto projects. Within each project, there are um, I think strong anecdotal data points to support how projects capture value. Um, you know, in Bitcoin, it's total, right? Like, you know, that, that's a very simple um, equation in many, in many cases because there's a limited supply and then it's just the law of supply and demand, um, uh, which, you know, gives VCs its own uh, and traditional Wall Street its own uh, heartburn, but we'll, we'll put that aside. Um, uh, but, but for, you know, for other projects, you know, there, there is this question of um, how does value accrue within a network? It, you know, it, if you're Bitcoin, you just hold it and there's, there's diminishing supply for new buyers to, to acquire. So you can see how price goes up if interest in acquisition goes up. Um, you know, in, in other projects where monetary policy isn't so certain, um, then you're relying on, you know, the really the team that is, in control or heavily influencing these projects to, to set a monetary policy and adjust it and run it. So you kind of have like that central trusted authority challenge. It's can be hard to underwrite. Um, and, and then, you know, if you have, those are all layer one protocol questions when you, when you rise up the layers to app tokens and, and others um, that are, you know, so-called utility tokens, it's not clear to me that anyone's going to hold these things to begin with. Like maybe you just trade in and out when you need them which implies very high monetary velocity, which implies that even if you have a lot of activity on a network, you might not be able to capture all that value. Um, and, and so there's been interesting work around these questions. Um, you know, 
taking you know ways to model the economy um, and account for monetary velocity, applying them to crypto networks. You know that that's an interesting area of research. Um, uh, and then you know uh, with with Bitcoin at least uh, there have been attempts to um, you know analyze Bitcoin stock to flow ratio and, and correlate it with market cap. Uh, you know for both historically and across other commodities, which is again interesting research. And then you have some attempts to uh, do simple correlations of like, you know, um, as hashing power increases, so does price. As active wallets increase, so does price. Or as, you know, GitHub, you know, pull and push requests increase. I mean, these are all, there's not valuation, right? It's just correlation. Um, so, so I think we have a ways to go on the valuation side. I think that may be actually one that is the last to fall. Like I think custody and regulatory uncertainty and these things will clear themselves up before, before valuation does. Um, and in the meantime, it's, it's very much a, um, I think it's a bet that cannot really be underwritten by, you know, solid valuation work. So, you know, the, 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 the last friction point or the second one, but the last one we can get to speak about um, in the present terms is equity or lack thereof, because inherent to decentralized, uh, decentralized finance, decentralized projects, you can't really get preferred uh, equity. There's not really equity to hold. Um, uh, but now with DeFi, and we're going to definitely get into DeFi, I would love to pick your brain on that. But, but well, sticking with this equity friction point, um, how, how, does proof of stake and, and, and uh, DAOs, uh, you know, kind of where you might not be able to get preferred equity and you might not be able to have control and tell a leader what to do. But if a VC fund were to actually buy enough governance tokens or a stake, enough coins, they actually would get say in how the project progresses. Is that something that would solve the equity problem? I don't think it solves the equity problem, but I think it provides an interesting alternative governance model that will be critical going forward. Um, I don't, I don't think it doesn't solve the equity problem. And, and I don't think crypto projects should try to solve the equity problem. Right. I, I don't think it's incumbent upon them to do so. I don't think they need to, they don't need to give a, um, exact analog, right. To VCs. Um, I, I think, you know, they can raise capital from other sources and they should do what's best for the project. And to the extent VCs want to participate in that, they can. And if they don't, they won't. And, that, and that's perfectly fine. Um, so, you know, governance is a whole kind of issue into itself. Again, you know, very new, lots of experiments. Um, and in fact, as it relates to value capture, you know, one of the theories about why, how, or how crypto tokens will capture value is through governance, right? The ability to vote and, um, and, uh, uh, and participate in some of the decision-making that goes on in the network. So, so that's also interesting. Um, you know, <clears throat> in order for a VC to participate in that kind of crypto native governance, you know, they have to like run a node. Um, they have to, you know, either custody tokens themselves or, um, or, or have a third party custody them. They have to make decisions around, you know, things like delegation, they have to understand the economics of the crypto network and, and you know, the decisions they're making. And, and it's kind of like all of that is a completely new field to learn, right? It, it is totally apart from the traditional governance structures set up in, in equity where you have a board of directors and the board of directors has certain legal responsibilities to common shareholders and every VC sits on a bunch of boards and they're like familiar with how that works. So, so the cognitive load of adding a new equity startup in terms of governance is very low, but the cognitive load of adding even your first token investment and participating in governance is probably higher than like all the previous equity uh, startup governance cognitive loads combined. <laughs> it's a mouthful, but right, I think you get my point. Um, so, you know, I, I think that, you know, I, I think that most traditional VCs are not going to be very active token investors. Um, I think, I think crypto native funds are much better suited 
to, to invest in tokens because they've been built from scratch, particularly for this asset class. Um, you know, they have engineers on hand, right, who know how to run nodes and participate in networks and build the infrastructure to, to stake and, and whatnot. Um, they, you know, they understand uh, governance, crypto economics at a, at a deeper level. Um, they're comfortable with liquidity. I mean, that, that's another area of friction, actually, that we didn't even touch on. Um, but, you know, in venture capital, uh, liquidity is often, um, uh, or sorry, illiquidity is, can be a feature, not a bug, right? So the fact that VCs cannot easily sell private shares, you know, post-investment, um, uh, but until there's like an M&A or IPO exit opportunity, I actually, again, reduces the cognitive load significantly. Right, you don't have to say you don't have to wake up every day and say, "Should I sell?" Right, there's only a couple decision points that may happen in terms of knowing when to sell. Um, in, in in liquid crypto tokens, it's not the case. Right, every day post investment, you need to be monitoring, um, you know, prices, the market, your risk, and and you know maybe you should sell two days after you buy. Maybe you should hold it for ten years. I mean, right, it's much it's much more akin to a hedge fund than, than a VC. Um, so apologies if you hear any, uh, no, listen, this is, this is, this is the zoom arrow. You could, this is recorded. You could please you could go take care of the, of the baby. That's, yeah, that's my, totally okay. my, my wife is with them, but, um, okay. two year old is, is, uh, it's, it's, it's totally okay. This is, this is the world <laughs> we live in and, and it's, uh, it's as accepted as possible. Um, yeah. and, and I think it's, I think it's interesting. Um, you know, the, the, the idea of VCs and, and blockchain and crypto, uh, because they kind of should be enemies and they kind of are enemies where, especially with the ICOs, but even now with DeFi, you know, VCs traditionally, like you mentioned before, were kind of the gatekeepers uh, to, 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 for funds, for small projects and developers uh, that, that historically didn't have access to money and to capital without going to a VC fund. And, and with the ICOs, and we could discuss whether the ICOs, you know, definitely were a bubble and whether they were done right, but but ICOs, it started with ICOs, but now with DeFi and, you know, th this opened up the door for one, projects to get access to capital from way more places, uh, from, uh, you know, from anywhere, essentially. And two, it also opened up the average person, someone without, you know, a million dollars or $20 million fund, they could have $5, they could have a dollar, and they could uh, then invest. So, um, you know, how, how does that feel and how does that work? Being in VC, um, you know, which, which I, I don't want to say you guys are the enemy, but, you know, you are one of the targets being disrupted by the blockchain field. You know, is, is there kind of a feeling, um, you know, obviously not with you because you're more open, but in the company that, hey, you know, watch out. What are you guys doing? These people could kind of knock us off our throne. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and I did mention that there's a little, there, you know, one of the things that got VCs to pay attention was like, whoa, the, you know, projects are raising money without going through VC. Like, what is this about? Um, I wouldn't say anyone is actually worried at this point. Um, and that's not to, you know, demean DeFi or crypto. It's just that it's, it's still a growing pie. Um, and, it, and crypto has actually added net new investment opportunities for VC, net new equity investment opportunities for VC. So I think it is true that you now have this growing category of um, founding teams who are raising capital to build new technology and they are not prioritizing going to VC. That, that is absolutely true. I think that's wonderful. Um, and that's one of the most exciting things about you know, crypto and DeFi, right? It's decentralized finance, it's you know, finance 2.0, you know, rebuilding an alternate financial system that does not rely on these central gatekeepers. So I think it's awesome. Um, and that provides a lot of opportunity for people who don't have, you know, who aren't able to get warm intros to VCs and, right, I mean, this whole, like, network and relationship-based economy and industry that we have, um, you know, if you're, you know, if you're in a country that doesn't have a VC fund, and you don't have those relationships, like you can still raise money, you can still invest. And, and that's, that's awesome. So, um, you know, so, so that's, 
that's great. I don't think VCs are afraid or fearful and I don't think they should be. I don't think we should be um, because one, there's still a thriving technology ecosystem outside of crypto that are providing plenty of investment opportunities. And that's the main focus for VCs right now still, even the ones that are very bullish on crypto. Um, so that hasn't diminished. The second thing is there's been, a, there's been a new category of investments, which are equity investments into blockchain companies um, that have been added because of crypto and have generated great returns already, even though it's still so early. Um, so, you know, Coinbase is the most obvious example, you know, they're an IPO track. Um, and, you know, there, there's a real gap to be filled in terms of getting, you know, your average person to be able to interact with the crypto economy in an easy to understand way without handling private keys and needing to understand, you know, all the intricacies of, of crypto. So, so that's a new opportunity that traditional VCs, I think, will, will continue to lead in. Um, and, and I think the other thing is that, you know, well, first, a lot of VCs are actually LPs in a lot of these crypto native funds, um, which is one of the strategies adopted by firms back in 2017 to get exposure, to spin up, um, ramp up their knowledge quickly into a new space, right? Like invest in a couple funds um, and then you you get um, upside exposure to, to those funds. And then you also get, um, you know, the ability to have conversations with those GPs and have, you know, you know, updates and information and all that. So, um, so, so, you know, traditional VC still has exposure through funds. Um, and then we do have some VCs who um, have moved aggressively into starting their own crypto native funds. I think Andreessen is probably the most prominent example. They have their own crypto fund. They're registered as a, as an RIA or registered investment advisor. So they can invest, you know, in a more flexible way. Um, and, you know, so, so that's possible and that's, that's, you know, an opportunity for traditional VCs. Um, so, so I don't think there's anything to worry about yet. Um, I say yet, like maybe that will change, right? I, you know, if, if blockchain really does eat all of software, then that's again, a separate conversation. Like maybe, maybe everything is blockchain and there is no equity anymore and everything's decentralized and everything is token based and, and then there will be some threat, but, um, I'm not convinced that will be the case. Like, even if it is the case, it, it, I think it's still far enough away. Um, so as not to be a, you know, a, an urgent, you know, threat or, or, or top of mind for, for most VCs. Well, you know, you mentioned that there still are uh, equity plays in blockchain companies and, and one of those companies in your guys' portfolio is, is Blockgraph. Uh, tell me a little bit about Blockgraph, you know, how you guys heard about them and, and what about it excited you guys to get involved? Are you talking about Block Damon? Well, uh, Block Damon is is a, is, a, is another one of your plays, but I believe Blockgraph is also a joint venture between, to the best of my knowledge, between Comcast, Charter Communications, and, and Viacom CBS. Was 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 that not uh, was that not Comcast Ventures? Was that Comcast themselves something different than you guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thanks for clarifying. Yeah, so so um, Comcast Corporate um, has a, you know an internal group, you know, doing. Um, following blockchain and, and doing blockchain experiments and, and projects. So Blockgraph was a part of that. I, I, I don't have up-to-date knowledge on that, so I won't be able to speak very intelligently on, on the Blockgraph project. Um, uh, but uh, the equity investment that we made um, at Comcast Ventures is Block Damon, um, you know, which is uh, a, a, you can think of it as like a, an app dynamics um, or Datadog, if, if folks are familiar with those companies, right? Like monitoring solutions for blockchain nodes. Um, and it's, a, it's an equity play. There's no tokens involved. Um, a lot of the big protocols are block daemon customers. And a lot of VCs are block daemon customers. Um, and so they're very kind of involved and native to the token ecosystem, but the, you know, it's an equity company, traditional startup and easy for VCs to invest in. Um, and so I think those are going to be the, the easiest uh, investment opportunities for traditional VC. Um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the custodians are, you know, equity venture backed startups. Um, a lot of the exchanges, uh, the centralized exchanges are equity venture backed startups. So, so there's, you know, it, there, there's analytics firms, there's trading firms, there's, you know, all, all kinds of opportunities, um, not to mention like, you know, enterprise blockchain projects, 
consumer applications like Coinbase and Flipside, you know, data plays like Coinmetrics. I mean, there's plenty of equity opportunities um, to get exposure to, to crypto. And I think a lot of firms, including ourselves, have, have made those investments. Well, you know, his, 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 traditionally VC funds or, you know, so now a lot of times VC funds don't just provide capital, but also uh, help with, you know, direction and vision, uh, give connections and networking to the companies that they invest in. Uh, do you guys find that tougher to do in the blockchain space just because it is so no, new and you guys don't necessarily have an expertise or, or do you find that, hey, you know, they might have the tech background, but, but we have that business savvy that they're missing out on. I think a lot of crypto, you know, founding teams do have a lot of business savvy too. Um, but, but I, but I get your point. Um, you know, so it, this is not a situation unique to crypto. Let's put it that way. Um, and, and what I mean by that is anytime there is a new technology, whether it's crypto or AI or quantum computing or, or anything else, um, there is often a new set of relationships, people um, that are involved in that industry that your VC firm, you know, your average VC will, will not have, um, you know, knowledge about, right? Because they haven't made investments in, and there's no reason why they should, you know, invest in those things until after they made an investment. Um, and so that first investment in that new space, uh, I think you're right that you know traditional vcs may not be as deeply embedded in the crypto ecosystem um but after you've made that first investment you have a pretty strong incentive to get involved um both to help your portfolio company uh and also to you know just understand the space and um source new opportunities and so that that's so you know after we invested in block daemon you know, we, we've, we've made it a point to, you know, be proactively involved in the space. Um, uh, you know, hence why I'm, you know, speaking here and, 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 you know, a bunch of other folks have done other things. Um, and, uh, and so we're building up that, that muscle memory and those relationships and the, and, you know, some domain knowledge, um, and that will grow over time. Right. And in five years and 10 years when we have made, you know, five or 10 more investments, um, then it, it won't seem so new. Um, and I think the other thing is that, you know, we, with these new areas, we, we like to partner, we're not the sole investors in these companies, right? So we like to partner with, uh, investors who bring something else to the table. So like in Block Damon's case, um, you know, on the one hand, they're building a traditional SaaS business. We know a lot about building traditional SaaS businesses. On the other hand, they're running blockchain nodes and they're participating in networks you know, doing all these things. We don't know as much about that. You know, we're learning, uh, but they have crypto native funds who invest in as well, who bring that expertise to the table. And so, you know, we can partner and, um, you know, it's often, you know, it's often good to have a partner and have a bunch of smart people on the table, um, all focused on helping the company succeed. And we try to do that. And, you know, there, there are many students watching this, you know, from universities all around the world. Um, what would you say to students right now who are interested in finance, you know, who might be going into, you know, a PE or VC or investment banking or anything like that, uh, who also have a love for blockchain. Is, it, is there, a, you know, is, is the future there for them? And, and what would you tell them uh, to focus on in their studies? That's a good question. Um, uh, you know, if you have a love for blockchain, then you should definitely pay attention to that. Um, and it's great to be early and, and build up your, your knowledge of a space that is not yet mainstream because that means there's you know, career upside for you if you do so. Um, you know, I would ask yourself like why you're interested in traditional finance. I think a lot of folks, because it's so mainstream, it's seen as lucrative, it's seen as safe, are interested in finance not because they love traditional finance but because you know, it's just what everyone does. It's what their parents want them to do. It's, you know, the best way to get a good job after, you know, college, these kinds of things. Um, and, you know, that's not a great reason to join an industry. Um, you know, maybe you need to do it for, you know, whatever your personal situation is and that, that's fine. But if you don't need to do it, 
um, you know, I would definitely encourage folks to follow what they're actually interested in and more so. Having said that, I think it is important to understand traditional finance, um, you know, or, or whatever industry, you know, uh, is relevant um, to, to your interest in blockchain because um, it can only add to your competency, right? So, um, and, and then there's probably a, a, you know, hybrid situation as well. I mean, there almost, there certainly is a hybrid situation where you're interested in blockchain um, and a lot of folks in traditional finance want to, you know, have people who are knowledgeable of blockchain work, work at their firm. So you could work for Goldman Sachs and be the blockchain guy or gal and be on the blockchain team and not be a traditional investment maker um, or a trader. And, um, and that, that's a great opportunity too. So, um, you know, so, so I, I, what I would, the last kind of parting, you know, piece I would say uh, to folks interested in blockchain, if you're a student now, um, is, you know, be, get so good that, that people can't ignore you, right? I love that line. Uh, I think Steve Martin, you know, the comedian and actor was the first one to, that I've heard say it, um, you know, and he was referring to his own comedic skills and he, he wanted to get so good at comedy that, you know, no one could, no one could ignore him or afford to ignore him. Um, and then there was a book that was influential for me by uh, a guy named Cal Newport who wrote it. The title was so good. They can't ignore you referencing the Steve Martin quote. Um, but basically getting, giving the advice of like, it's great to have interest and passion. And the first step is identifying what that passion is. But the second step, which a lot of people don't make the leap of because it's hard and it takes you know, deliberate practice and it's not as fun as kind of that initial honeymoon phase of your interest is getting really good at that interest. So good that people can't ignore you. Um, so, you know, whether that's a technical skill around blockchain or the economic side or the business side or whatever it is, um, you know, time is your most precious resource, like invest in skill development and, and get so good that, that, you know, whether it's Goldman or Coinbase, they can't ignore you. Well, Morgan, I really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, this, this side of the, of, of the blockchain world, the VC side, is not a side that, that many people from my world get to see. So I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to explain it to us and, uh, and, and show us a little bit what's happening behind the scenes. And, uh, go, and uh, for all of our viewers at home, for Reimagine 2020, I'm Yona Hockhauser. Thanks for watching.